Hello. Um, so, lots of what I've seen in both what um, our resident time traveler, Kate, and, uh, and what you've just seen have in common with what we do. And um, what we started doing is that we make music out of time series data that has to do with the body. We do it because it enables people to connect emotionally to data that is otherwise meaningless. Um, we think the quantify itself failed single-handedly to make people healthier. And instead, we decided to do experiments like Pulse, which is on the iTunes store, but um, was made as an experiment for the South by Southwest Festival last year for a set by Flying Lotus where we were just trying to visualize and sonify the heart rate of people attending the festival. So we sat outside Austin Art Museum and gave people a download link and you know they logged in. And it just made a little bit of music out of their cardiovascular data based on capturing their heart rate from the iPhone in the same way that people like Azumio had by lighting up the flash and capturing their brachial pulse from their finger using the camera. And then we used what Peter Brinkman at Google and people like Martin Roth and Peter Kern and Robert Thomas, who's here today and is about to perform, released a while ago called libpd, which encapsulated the pure data environment um, so that you could use it in a mobile environment. So we did that. Um, and then we were going to take it offline, but thousands of people from all over the world started using it. And we hadn't really publicized it outside of South By, so we didn't understand why. Um, but we thought that it would be interesting to see just how many countries and just how many people and um, what that meant. And this started from a, a, a really similar point to this kind of research in brain activity where I was in the US trying in a brain mapping project where the idea was to produce tools that would, uh, um, that would entrain people into focus that otherwise could not. Our primary target were soldiers returning from theaters of war suffering from PTSD, um, early onset dementia patients, and children diagnosed with ADHD, including my own son, for whom I made a tiny app that made him balance a marble in the middle of the screen and made dissonant music outside the circle and consonant music inside it. And the seconds that he spent doing that, um, he negotiated minutes with me, playtime. He'd been diagnosed with ADHD and prescribed Ritalin, and then two weeks into doing that, and two weeks after me refusing Ritalin treatment for him, his teachers came to see me and said, we're so glad you put him on Ritalin, he's doing a lot better, and Ritalin is not so evil, you'll, you'll, you won't regret it. And I thought, yeah, okay, so I've just bypassed a $9 billion a year industry in drugs that blatantly don't have to be used because we can do something else than that. The interest in terms of using musical tools or otherwise emotionally engaging tools to draw attention to the body came from my own experience in that around 2004, I was running a software company. I'm a musician, I studied music, but software paid the bills, so I wrote some software for banks and we were running a, a tiny startup that did that, but it got a bit stressful and I had a heart attack at Brussels airport. And while I was in the ambulance, they brought me back with paddles. But unfortunately, the ambulance had already transmitted what's called the death code. So the paperwork at the hospital had already started when I arrived. So when I woke up, the nurse handed me my toe tag and said, I think you need to do something about the level of stress you're under, because I reckon that dying uh, en route is you know, um, not something you want to do twice. So I, you know, I thought about it and I, I, I tried to do yoga and tai chi and I tried to work less and drink less and smoke less and do the natural things that people tell you to do. But I found that actually going back to music for me was, was a far, far easier way to engage with what happened. The end result of what we've done at BioBeats is that we do projects like put heart-shaped pods all around the city of Melbourne in Australia and let people engage with that. And we do it for people like Metamucil, who are like a cholesterol fiber thing brand. But what we're gathering in the background is the data from, from people's stress level. 
Do I have sound? By any chance? I don't know if you can see anything on your screens. You can? OK. That's what your heart sounds like when it's turned into music. That's so cool. <laughs> I have five children, and when I had my heart attack, we were expecting our fifth kid. Uh, so when he was born, I was really conscious that was a close call. You know, it, it just focused the mind on the heart. Now, what happens during that sort of exercise is that if you're there with the pot, you hear all sorts of stuff, that guy telling something about his heart attack, uh, somebody told us about their divorce, um, somebody lost their house. I mean, there was just, I mean, people tell you stuff that you, it's like being a priest a little bit. And, and in some way, it relates to the fact that when we map this data, when we map the data from the Australian project and from the South by Southwest project, um, it happened all over the world. So we had data from all over the world. But when we mapped US alone and correlated to um, obesity in the US, we found the same red belt from Detroit to New Orleans. And we asked an epidemiologist to tell us what that really meant. Uh, his name is Parthos N. Gupta. He's the head of cardiology at Mount Sinai. And his answer was, well, low HRV rates, which is what you look at because you're interested in stress, correlate to obesity because if you're carrying a lot of weight around, um, your heart feels under a kind of pressure that makes the vortex that drives it behave as though it's under serious stress. So we had a conversation with Bupa about what stress could mean if you drove an intervention that could help people lower blood pressure using music as a guide when the music was made out of cardiovascular rate alone. So we wrote a, a, an app for them that allowed people to have a musical guide. It was just a breath guide. It was based on Harvard Medical School's Six Breaths um, Guide. Which the idea being that within two minutes you can reduce your blood pressure enough to bring your adrenaline, your cortisol level down. And this is the kind of thing I would have loved to have when, when, when I was stressed enough to, to, you know, to have a, a sort of cardiac arrest incident. Talking to Bupa about insurance and about health during this kind of experiment where we tested a few hundred people using the app um, for six weeks was interesting because when they asked me about why this happened and how I wanted to do it and why I wanted to do it, and I told them the Brussels story, they said, oh, you're an E29. And you know, I said, well, what's an E29? It's just like, oh, those are people we can't insure. So, and they include things like people who've been pronounced dead before. I'm like, oh, all right. Okay. I'm just saying thank you. It's nice to know that I can't have life insurance from you. So if you ever want to get life insurance, don't tell us that. Like, oh yeah, okay. So they prompted us to do something that was always going to happen. Right? We stood on the shoulders of giants, people like RJDJ and people like Peter, uh, P, uh, like Peter Brinkman at Google, right? people who'd understood the data flow environments that we were using and encapsulated them in ways that would have taken us years and in fact took people like RJDJ years. And we started to think about what would happen if we made music out of movement alone, not just inside data but outside data, and how could we correlate that to what actually happens in people's bodies. On those screens, that'll probably be hard to read, but what Forbes magazine wrote about us was this could have social functions. Um, we, we hadn't really thought about what that meant, right? They said, this is a valid form of clinical therapy. That's never what we wanted. We were just trying to experiment with what it could mean to bring people's attention to their bodies and make them stop and stare. All I wanted was to teach people meditation and, and medit basic tiny meditation techniques in a way that, that would be effective and emotionally intelligent as opposed to asking people to stop, which never, never works. So, so, then it turned out that actually the data from engagement from the apps, the, the analytics we were running, told us that people have an attention span of that of a newt on asset. 
So basically, people have about three, four seconds of attention span that is valid. And after that, it's all rubbish, and they're connected to something else. On their phones, I mean. So there's always an interruption. There's always some kind of spastic kind of movement that goes from what they're doing to what they think they should be doing instead. So I spoke to Linda Stone. I don't know if you guys know Linda Stone, but she talks about email apnea, the fact that people hold their breath when they email, and the, their, the so levels of acidity in their blood become so high that the cortisol level starts to rise. It can kill you over time. The blood pressure just goes up steadily. And then it's very hard to come, to, for it to come down. It takes months. So the interesting thing about Linda is that when she saw what we were trying to do, she said, oh, what you do is you build toys for autonomic resilience. It took us a little while to understand what she meant. It turns out that what she meant was there's the parasympathetic nervous system, which is what you do when you hug somebody and well, somebody you like, and, um, and you, what you feel when oxytocin is running through your body, and when you're calm and feel safe, your parasympath parasympathetic nervous system is activated. Your sympathetic nervous system is what you do when you're running away from a lion or about to get in a fight or feeling really stressed. Fight or flight response, that's sympathetic. And what she was saying was, what you're building is resilience. So you're resilient to sympathetic response. And that means that you're autonomous, that you can engage parasympathetic responses autonomically. And she said, you need to take it away from the phone and put it in things, real toys, real physical toys, that do the same. Hide the circuitry, hide the screen, and do it again. So I designed a thing called the stone. Didn't know what else to call it. I wanted it to feel like a river stone. I wanted it to be really heavy. The first prototype for which was a piece of foam with two ECG plates, which we made basic music out of. Because we came from brainwave research, we already knew how to sonify things, but we already also knew that no matter how many brain functions you map, and obviously it's impressive to map 120 of them, in our research we mapped two, the idea of um, you know, high alpha versus low beta, so activation, focus, calm, relaxed focus. That's all we really wanted. But when you map heart rate variability data, you have a real challenge in your hands, which is that actually heart rate variability data can indicate diabetes, the onset of Parkinson's, um, serious stress problems, but also things like atrial fibrillation and the onset of stroke. So sonifying that, it's much, much harder. What am I at, 12 minutes? Okay, I'm gonna try and finish earlier than the 15, because I know that we're late. This is the second version of what we did, which was the foam with an Arduino board inside. Then we switched to an Odroid board. We built a LibPD version that could run on an Odroid board and then um, build a different foam thing that had brass plates to it, which turned out to be much more conductive. This is where we've ended up. Um, I don't know if that's playing or not. Is it playing? A wonderful designer in Milan called Ambra Day took my original idea and made what I think is an un unbelievably wonderful thing that doesn't look symmetrical. It has a speaker built into it, and we took, we took the grill design from the 90s, 50s radio that Apple clearly blatantly stole for the first iPod design. And um, we thought, you know, stealing is, you know, just as flattering for us as, uh, for, for, you know, it's, if it's valid for them, then it should be valid for us. That's the three prototypes, and the final prototype, which we'll exhibit at London Design Festival at Christie's on the 18th of September. And inside it, it's just a, you know, a really good speaker, the best we could afford, and a circuit board that somebody at University of Bath built, built that runs MicroPython. We moved away from LePD to Python-based audio engines, in particular one called PYO, which allows us to actually do generative synthesis. We came from that world anyway, the idea of using genetic coevolution or genetic co-evolving algorithms, one of which criticized the idea of a, an audio solution to a problem, like sonifying a time series body of data, and the other being a, a, a critic, a critic algorithm that could understand and maybe validate the musical coherence of it. I'm out of time, and I, I promised that I would try to be faster than this, but, um, but that's all we've got. Thank you very much.